Okay, so in contrast with classical conditioning, we're now going to talk about operant or instrumental conditioning. And the key difference is classical conditioning is essentially passive learning about condition stimuli that, that are associated with uh, outcomes, whereas operant conditioning is actually generating motor actions, behavior that leads to outcomes. Okay, and here the key idea is Thorndike's law of effect which is essentially that actions that lead to good things are stamped in, they're reinforced. Um, you're more likely to produce those actions in the future and actions that lead to bad outcomes are stamped out. Uh, we can actually understand the very detailed neural basis of how this learning works in terms of the effects of dopamine bursts, those little increases in dopamine that we saw, or dips according with bad outcomes, those pauses, and how that drives learning in the basal ganglia. And so this law of effect can actually be understood right down at the level of the circuitry in the brain, and in particular about the ability of the basal ganglia to decide what to do next and what not to do under the influence of these dopamine signals. Uh, we have this idea that we talked about before that the basal ganglia is really important for action selection. So there's a lot of different possible things that you're considering, actions that you might perform up there in the cerebral cortex. Um, and then the basal ganglia is kind of responsible for s selecting among all those different possible kind of channels of action, so to speak, which one you're going to do. And we know uh, that the action of the basal ganglia here is the kind of three key steps in the basal ganglia circuitry. And the last step involves this process of uh, disinhibiting activity in this final output pathway. Um, and this is a very kind of strange negative sign interacting with a negative sign. And if you remember two, two negatives make a positive. And so you can see that right here, here's activity in the input of the striatum uh, that leads to a inhibition of this intermediate area in the striatum that the SNR. Um, and then that is uh, reflects a disinhibition of activity in the superior colliculus. And one of the main pathways through the basal ganglia shown here is involved in triggering eye movements. Uh, most of the rest of the pathways actually involve going back up into the cortex. Here's how the actual circuitry works for the basal ganglia as it connects with the frontal cortex. And here the, the final circuit goes through the thalamus and has this kind of bi-directional excitatory loop. So in the context of that, we have a uh, projection from the frontal cortex and actually other areas into the striatum. And you have these two critical different pathways in the striatum, the go pathway and the no-go pathway. So the go pathway uh, has direct projections into the output of the basal ganglia. In this case, it's the GPI. It's really equivalent to the SNR that we saw in the previous figure. Um, and this is that inhibitory connection. And then you have another inhibitory connection Normally, as we saw in this previous figure, the GPI is firing tonically all the time. And then uh, what happens when the GO pathway fires, it inhibits that activity and that disinhibits the thalamus. And then that opens up this loop here, allowing the frontal cortex to get activated through this kind of thalamocortical loop. That promotes the selection of a particular action plan that you are considering up there in frontal cortex and enables you to engage that plan and kind of makes that final decision. I'm going to go, I'm going to do it. Okay. That's the key step here in this pathway. And it's this kind of weird, you know, double negative uh, disinhibition kind of process. In opposition to that is this no-go pathway. So if you look over here on this panel, again, the same circuitry, and now we're looking at this no-go pathway, also, also known as the indirect pathway it has one further step along the way. It goes through this GPE, the external segment of the globus pallidus. Um, that extra step, that extra minus sign, turns this into three minus signs, which is odd number of minus signs, which means it has a net negative effect. And so as we saw here, the GPE normally is uh, active and inhibiting the GPI. And so if the no-go pathway fires, it actually inhibits and therefore disinhibits uh, the GPI. And that disinhibition has the consequent effect of then leading to more inhibition of the thalamus.
Um, and so these go and no-go neurons are essentially driving this opponent process in decision-making. Should I do it? Should I not do it? Kind of the classic like devil and angel on your shoulders. You can just think about it in that way. The no-go and the go are just kind of battling it out. Should I do it or not? That's the fundamental decision that the basal ganglia is making. That's all the kind of crazy circuitry. And again, we won't ask you questions about this on the test, uh, but just again, all this kind of detail is just so you know that there is the full story here and hopefully you get some sense of how it, how it works. Uh, the dopamine plays into these circuits such that when you get a burst of dopamine, after you took an action, so you said go, Okay, and then as a result of that, you've got some dopamine coming in later in time that makes it extra complicated. Um, that has this effect of reinforcing the go pathway so that you're more likely to do that action again in the future. And that is driven by these D1 receptors that happen to be on the neurons in this go pathway. They have a net excitatory and kind of facilitating effect. And what they're actually doing is increasing the strength of the synaptic, synaptic connections from uh, the inputs, you know, from frontal cortex and other areas into these neurons in that kind of go pathway. At the same time, you have these D2 receptors on the no-go pathway. Those are net inhibitory um, and it has the kind of opposite pattern of effects. And so when you get that burst of dopamine for a good outcome, that then actually leads to a decrease in synaptic strength in connections into the no-go pathway. So this gives rise to uh, Thorndike's law of effect for this part of the story. Um, if you take an action and you have some positive result from that, um, those are stamped in through synaptic potentiation or LTP into the go pathway neurons and LTD into the no-go pathway neurons. Interestingly, you have the exact opposite pattern that takes place if you have that dip in dopamine. So if you take an action and it leads to a worse than expected outcome, uh, then you get that kind of reduction in dopamine firing. And because that, that dopamine was excitatory on the GO pathway, those guys are actually less activated. Um, that, that leads also to a LTD or decrease in the synaptic strength of, uh, into those neurons. Um, but paradoxically, kind of interestingly, it does actually facilitate um, learning in the no-go pathway. And this makes sense computationally. If, if you have a bad outcome, next time around, you want to have a stronger opposition to that, that uh, choosing that action. And really, that's what the no-go is. It's kind of this opposition party. It's saying, don't do it. We want those neurons to have their synapses stronger so that they're better able to say no-go next time. And that's in fact exactly what happens. If you have a dip in uh, that dopamine, uh, then you actually end up doing LTP in that no-go pathway uh, from its inputs. So in fact, amazingly, uh, through these very detailed uh, uh, biological mechanisms, we end up recovering this exact uh, Thorndike law of effect. Good things lead to strengthening of go, Bad things lead to uh, weakening of go and strengthening of no go. Here's some other phenomena associated with operant conditioning. There are these things called secondary reinforcers. So instead of giving somebody like, you know, a uh, actual drop of juice for performing some action, we often just pay them money, right? And what is money? It's just paper. You know, how does that mean anything? And so the idea is that it's something that's associated with a primary reinforcer. So in fact, money is associated with many different outcomes. So it's a, it's a very generalized secondary reinforcer. If you wanna train animals to do kind of crazy things that they wouldn't otherwise do. Uh, so for example, surfing, um, you have to start with a shaping procedure. So you have to start, you know, hey, why don't you jump on this surfboard on dry land? Um, I'll give you a little treat. If you jump on the surfboard on dry land, they associate that with a positive outcome, they're more likely to jump on the surfboard. And now you start building up, going further out, and uh, little do you know, soon your dogs are surfing. Circus trainers who train uh, animals in the circus, which I guess is soon becoming a thing of the past, um, is uh, it relies critically on these kind of shaping procedures. And lastly, uh, we're gonna talk about imitation learning. People always talk about this like monkey see, monkey do you know, aping somebody, you know, imitating them. 
it turns out that there's actually not that much evidence uh, that this is kind of a built-in uh, way of learning. Originally, there was a lot of excitement about uh, ideas that babies uh, would naturally imitate, you know, even from birth. Um, but the data now suggests that it may be more that they're prone to do certain kinds of actions uh, when they're getting kind of social interaction and, and that looked like imitation, but it wasn't actually uh, imitation. And so the evidence for really kind of strong, innate imitation kind of learning is, is much weaker than we originally thought. But there is this really fascinating finding that uh, you can see a pattern of neural activity um, that is very similar when the monkey does an action themselves compared to seeing somebody else perform that action. Um, and it's in these kind of frontal areas here that you see at this F4, F5, uh, in these, these frontal uh, regions that are sort of supplementary motor areas. And so it's kind of like the monkey is sort of internalizing the action that the other person is performing, sort of seeing the, that other action kind of as if they were themselves performing that action. So this is a really exciting finding. Uh, a lot has been written about this and probably uh, because it's so fascinating, you know, a lot of it may be slightly overblown. But on the other hand, it's clear that we do have this ability to kind of internalize the actions of other people. And as you get older, so not as a, as a kind of neonatal infant, you certainly see evidence that people are prone to mimic other people um, and behave like other people, it's like body posture and stuff. You just have this implicit uh, subconscious kind of tendency to imitate what other people are doing. I'm particularly bad offender in this. So we do have this ability, but it's something that takes a lot of learning. And I think personally that it's, it's a reflection of this kind of predictive learning mechanism that is essentially predicting what other people's actions are using the same neural substrates that we predict our own actions. Um, and we'll talk more about this in the social psychology chapter about models of the self. But one question that's been really raised here is like, does this mean that, you know, when you watch some kind of violent media or something, does that cause you to act more violent yourself? Because you're kind of internalizing those things. And actually, the evidence is pretty mixed on that. Not nearly as strong as if this was a major, major effect. Still a lot of healthy debate about that. So lots of interesting things. So the, obviously the imitation learning in a positive side would be useful for how we might, you know, learn to behave and do things like other people. Imitating is a very powerful way of learning. And again, we do think this happens kind of as you develop a lot of sensory motor skills yourself and, and have that ability to map the external world into your own mental kind of representations of yourself. But it's not something that seems to be present kind of as a bootstrapping learning mechanism for just the early stages of learning. It's much more about a later stage of learning. Once you've learned a lot of stuff yourself, then you're in this position to be able to kind of mirror or map other people's behavior into your own uh, space.